Happy Saturday, everybody. You're yeah, welcome to the Today's Woman Show. My name is Rene Q. Boating, and we're here at the Movin Pick Ambassador Hotel in the heart of Accra. Today is going to be uplifting. You really cannot miss it. We'll be right back. It's time for the monologues. This is when we hit the streets of Accra and we meet different women and we ask their opinions on various topics. Let's hear what they have to say. I'm a gender advocate, you know, you know to begin with. So for me, there's no difference between uh, when it comes to responsibilities. A man can be a man and a woman can be a man. When it comes to responsibilities, it's a collective responsibility between the man and the woman. If the children are many, you alone can control. So you can't be the head of the family. It creates us to be the same. We are both different. We all have our unique stuff. What a man can do is what a man can do. What a woman can do is what a woman can do. As to whether or not the other can do better, it depends on who the person is. You can be a woman and you can go beyond and do so many great stuff because of who you are and how you believe in yourself. It, does, it has nothing to do with whether women can do more or men can do more. It's about the passions you have for whatever you want to do. So yeah. Women shouldn't be heads of families. Yeah, because um, I think men are in their nature leaders. Not, I'm, I'm not saying that to uh, bring um, women down in some parts, but it's just nice. Why would a woman want to head a family? Men are so, like they are something else. They are all in all in their nature to head families. It's not prestigious for ladies to head families. You can help your man head a family or you can help your family, but you can't head your family. Women can't be the heads of family because it's like stereotyping. We all know that it's men that can, are heads of their family. It's everywhere, in every culture, and even in religion, especially in Islamic religion. We believe that men are the heads of their family. And I believe that what men can do, women can also do. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, you shouldn't sit and just let your husband provide you with everything you do, or everything of yours, like even your clothes and anything. You have to support the family if you are married with children. Like dual income earners, the husband is working, the wife is working to support the children. It shouldn't be only like the, the, the husband that should do all these things. The woman should be in support of everything, and also support in everything. Me, to my knowledge, I will use my, my parents as an example. It's, it's all around. A woman can be the head, a man can be the head. It all depends on, um, let's assume in, um, the, guy, um, the man, maybe his working ability is a bit low. And let's assume in the woman's working ability is a bit higher than her husband. So that one, definitely, like there are some things the woman can take care in the house. Like, not necessarily that the woman has to be the head, but it's, 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 it's normal for the woman to, you know, to be like to help a bit in a family yeah not necessarily but in in all in all like in our natural fact we all know that the men are the head of the family yeah a man can be can also be a head of a family depending on the situation at home because we sometimes find situations where the man may not be working and the woman would be doing all the work and a whole lot but that shouldn't give the right to the woman to try to overshadow the man at um at um in the house because definitely you know how men can be having this perception that they have to be heads of the family and a whole lot of things but in a situation where the man is not working definitely the woman has to assume that rule but it has to be done carefully It's time for the woman on the move. She's a female entrepreneur, extremely hardworking. Let's see who she is. Business usually starts with a lack of employment after school, but for Farzana of 
zero's fault. It was the lack of satisfaction at a white collar job that drove her into the entrepreneurial field. The journey began three years ago with only a started capital of 500 cities. She left a well paying media job to the kitchen to provide home cooked meals for nine to five workers. When I was doing the normal eight to nine job, I I was still doing some orders for people because I did my NSS at a hotel. So I was doing orders for my friends and stuff. And then I was gaining a lot more than what I was being paid at my former job. So with that, I decided that why not? This is what I love to do. So I would rather stop and then establish myself properly and then. Support from family was needed in the early days with her sister's kitchen serving as a business location. Her first clients were also colleagues of her sister. I, I deal with um, some law firms like um, Ashon Benjamin. They are located at Lab Laboni. And then Fuga. They are located at um, the World Trade Center. I deal with Jumia Ghana. They are office at um, Abelempe. Yeah, some of them order from there, about most of them order from Jumia Ghana from me, and then bust um, bulk oil storage and transportation. Yeah. When she first started, she was among a handful of people who were into the lunch ordering services, and she felt she definitely was going to succeed. However, the business suffered a temporary setback when I started, I was doing it at my house. That's my sister's house. But later, I had to stop and then get a place. It's my sister's kitchen. We cook for the house, and then because the order, and then because the orders were becoming a lot, I had to move from there because the kitchen is not as big as this place. Feeling like a failure, she resigned herself to looking at other business prospects. But the pains of her first love kept pulling at her. Like the saying goes, if it's at first you don't succeed, pick yourself up and try again. In 2018, returned with new found vigor, ready to succeed at all costs. Yes, it was difficult. It took months. I knew the place was here already because I stayed right opposite it. <laughs> so I knew this place was there, but to convince the person to give it to me was very, very difficult because the place wasn't like this. It was, it was abandoned for a very long time. So before the person could allow me to do it here, I had to actually go to certain places. I even tried to put up a structure at my compound, at my compound in the house because it was becoming difficult, and the way I was getting was a bit far. I didn't want to go far away from my house. The pause in her services caused a dip in her clientele, and so she had to devise new ways to rule them back. Her first tactic was providing free delivery services for food order, a thing most of her competitors were not offering. My delivery is free. It's part of my package, so that I can get the customers on board, and then my delivery the dispatch rider has to go almost about let's say eight places or ten places a day before he's done and then with that some people are closer some people are far because i deliver from here to accra from here to laboni so those who are closer sometimes get their food early sometimes they delay the dispatch rider because when he gets there, he calls them. It, it takes time before they come out. So that means that they delay those who are behind. And then sometimes it causes a lot of misunderstanding because my food has to get there between later by one. She has a firm belief that she will define the odds to be a leader in the food and hospitality sector. My name is Farizana de Graft Savage, CEO of Zane's Catering and Event Services. Um, my advice to everyone or anyone who wants to start his or her business is that you should go ahead and start it. With any little income that you have, you should start it. Start from somewhere and then you'll get to wherever you want to get to.
Our winning woman for today is a winner, and she's Adenike Oyechunde Akwaba. Medase. You got it. Yay, high five. <laughs> yeah. You're very, very welcome to Ghana. So it's your first time in Accra. Yes. What do you think so far? Oh, my God. There's power. So, yes. Oh, so when you said power, you meant electricity. I thought you meant strength. I meant electricity. I have experienced so far 24 hours of uninterrupted power supply, and that's been bliss. Well, again, welcome to Ghana. Thank you. Okay. Now, I was so excited when I heard you were in town. Um, I've heard of your book, Adenike. Yes. Your story, your movie, His Glory. Yes. We're going to talk about it. Yes. Such an inspiration. I follow you on Instagram. So do and, I. Okay. And I just thought, when I heard you were coming, I thought she has to be on the Today's Woman show. Everybody has to hear your story. You are an inspiration, and it's time to inspire Ghana. Yes. So, Akwaba, again. Medase. Medase. Okay, you've got it. So, tell us a bit about you. Okay, so um, a bit about me. I am an only child of both my parents. I love to eat a lot. Um, I hate to drive. I picked up reading not so long ago, and I have a target for the number of books I should read in the year. Oh, you do? Okay. Yes. I'm trying to travel a lot more, and um, I'm also trying to open my palate to various meals. So, you know, just, just a bit about who I am. Um, Your childhood growing so up. So now my childhood, tomboy, 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 play football with the boys, We'll climb the trees, we'll roll the tires with there, we'll play with the um, top of the soda bottles. Um, I was always hardly ever at home. Um, you know, so yeah, I was never really domesticated. I just never understood why the girl has to be the one to cook and clean and all of that. I'm very thankful that my parents did not allow me into that gender role. Mm. They would allow me to do that. They would also allow me to play football with the boys. Right. So you did I, both? I did both. Okay. So I had the you know, best like of both. Like Exactly. So growing older now, I'm like, okay, you really need to know how to cook to survive. You know? <laughs> so yeah, cooking is for survival. But yeah, okay. basically. Okay. So that's basically it. So, so growing up, you wanted to be a lawyer. You actually studied law. Yes, I'd okay. always wanted to be a lawyer. I grew up in a place called Ikoi in Lagos, Nigeria. Okay. And somehow Ikoi still has a lot of, um, well, a number of the judicial divisions of the various courts that exist in Nigeria. And I remember seeing the very first female justice I'd ever seen. But I didn't know she was a justice. I didn't know she was a lawyer. I didn't know she was on the bench. But I just knew that she was one person that garnered a lot of respect. And I was puzzled, like, who is this woman? Everybody's giving so much respect. And then I found out. I'm like, oh, my God. And I just said it, you know, into the universe. I said, oh, I would love to be a lawyer one day. It was because of her? I think it's very strongly. She had um, a lot. She, I was a child. You aspired so, yes, to be like so, her. You know, impressionable mind. Mm. And somehow, once you're loquacious, people feel, oh, you have to be a lawyer. You have to be yeah. a lawyer. I'm like, okay, let's try this art thing. And I wasn't good with the sciences. I'm like, yay, time to study law. And it was a childhood dream for me to become a lawyer. Somehow, I don't know what happened, but you know, practice became a different ball game mentality. But qualified. So you, so you actually graduated? I as, did. As, as graduated, lawyer, undergrad, and went to the Nigeria Law School, finished with a second class offer. Congratulations. Opera. Thank you. I was called to the Nigerian bar years ago. So, yeah, graduated. Okay, but you didn't practice? No. Nah. And then I, I, I see you, you, you diverted into media. How did Absolutely. you get there? Absolutely. So my father used to be in media. He retired in media. So I suspect that the seed had been sown somewhere along the line because I would always hang out with him at work, you know, after school, commute with dad after work and all of that. What was he doing in media? He, was, he retired as a news um, editor at the okay. Federal Radio Corporation of Nigeria. Okay. And um, so I suspect uh, that's where, you know, my love for media started. And after qualifying at, you know, as a lawyer and all of that, being called to a bar, I wasn't sure. I was in that space where I was finding myself. Mm. And somehow opportunity did present itself and I got an internship slot at a radio station. And I'm a newsy person. So I'm like, hey, okay, let's see what, you know, how things work behind the scene with the radio. I didn't have any, you know, degree in mass communication. I had not had any qualification prior to that. And I'm thankful for my then employers because they allowed me to learn right. a job. And I interned, I got the job, and I did it for a few years. And I learned a whole lot. I wow. met a lot of people. I fell in love literally with the world of media, um, radio, and then having to learn how to stay before television became another journey for me. But, you know, as I say... So you went to television as well? No, I, not, not officially, but 
occasionally but always someone would always remind hey i want you to come on my show i want you to come on my show but not like you're on the today's woman show today I know. Hello. <laughs> okay so yeah so that's a, a, the genesis of how i delve into the world of media and then public relation has attracted me so i'm really thinking okay you guys. so what are you doing now so right now um i'm doing my advocacy with disability mm -hmm. um nothing particularly with media mm -hmm. or with law and I feel very strongly that with my book, it's giving me now a, a bigger platform for me to not only share my story with the world and as many people that are asking me about the story, but to also tell us as a people that it's time for action. There's time for action. It's time for us to do more. If there are over 30 million people across the globe living with various forms of disability, it means that Africa cannot sit you know, again down and act like she doesn't know what's going on. She needs to stand up and then face squarely Head the on. wide spectrum of disability that does exist. Because mm -hmm. somehow we think it's disability. Everybody thinks physical disability like I didn't care. Mm. And people forget, hello, mm. you know, there's a mental disability. Yeah. There are many disabilities yeah. that are not physical. Mm. And those are the ones that I feel like we have just taken for granted for so long. So my focus in this season of my life is to just go squarely on disability advocacy and more specifically with my kind of disability. So tell us about your story. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, what part of the story? I'm going to be funny. Yes. Well, you know, um, a lot of the time, talking about disabilities, a lot of the time people just assume that disability is from birth. Oh. Apart from if it was a car accident, mm. for example, yeah. you know, you meet somebody you know, who probably, mm -hmm. you know, has crutches like you do. And people just assume yeah. that, you know, she was born like that. He was born like that, you know. So, you know, tell us your story. What happened? Oh, okay. So in my second year in university, mm -hmm. I went home because I was, off, you know, I was staying on campus. Mm -hmm. So I had gone home from um, school and power issue. So my parents had um, run out of water in their reservoir and in their barrels. So just before I left um, home, um, electricity was restored. It's a good child that I am. I thought, hey, why don't I help them fill up their barrels? So I had done everything and I was with the last bucket and the, I just slipped. I literally just slipped and, you know, I had this very, very hard fall. And my, I remember my dad was in the living room with, with, with a guest and they came to me and helped me up and then gave me an still, you know, um, gave me some pain re um, relief mm -hmm. medication. And I went to school. This happened on a Sunday. I went to school and I kid you not, I'm trying to remember what happened between Sunday and Thursday, but I remember vividly that but Thursday I had lectures and somehow I just couldn't get out of bed at 8 a.m. So I told my roommates, very playful me, everybody thought, eh, she's just messing around. And when it was 9 a.m., when it was almost time, you know, to get ready, the gent noticed that, look, this young lady hasn't gotten out of bed. So you couldn't get out I of bed? I just couldn't get out. Due to pain or? It was my, I just couldn't stand up. Oh. I just didn't, my legs, you know, my leg was just, it wasn't just working. I couldn't get out of bed. Um, so my friend who was supposed to get me from home to school, then mm -hmm. had to take me back home, like home where family mm -hmm. is. And that literally just started the journey because... Mm -hmm. My parents were even surprised in the first instance. Like, you just you barely left home how many days ago? What's going and, and on? And when you when you when you left that day, you were walking normally. I did. I, I actually walked to the park. I went to get on the bus to school, and then I went to school. And from the junction, I walked into my apartment. And you know, my parents didn't understand. I also didn't understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. So my friend took me, carried me literally in his arms, and you know, put me in this car, brought me you know to town to Lagos then. And we went to the hospital the next day and they, oh, let's do the scan. And then we did the scan and, you know, the doctors had mentioned that owing to the fall, there was a blood clot. Mm. So that was what instigated the um, inability to move the joint in the knee. I'm like, oh, that explains a lot. Oh, okay, so what's the way forward? They said, we're going to have to drain it. I'm like, sure. So we had a minor drainage and mm -hmm. um, it felt, I actually did ask to see the blood that was drained. And I saw, oh, this is not the regular red colored blood. It was you dark. Actually, you actually... Oh, I'm spooky like that. Okay. <laughs> so I went to school. I was seemingly getting better. And then it started to deteriorate again. And then my father had to come get me from school. Went through the whole gamut of doing the testing and the scannings again. And then realized that, oh, the first drainage wasn't properly done. So we had oh, to do it again. Wow. So I did it again and it just went downward spiral. I wasn't getting any better. And I suspect that the, the, the doctor might have also um, 
added emotions because, of course, he was a family. He was introduced to us by a family mm. friend, and he knew that I was an only child. So I suspect that the moment where he knew I wasn't responding to treatment, he didn't know how to tell the family, like, I think this is something way bigger than we probably mm. thought. So he said, you know what, let's refer you guys to the National Orthopedic Hospital. So I was referred there and biopsy and tests here and there. And, you know, the doctors just show up and say, hey, young lady, you have cancer. So they said, Wednesday, we're booking you for, you know, a They surgery. just told you that? Just like that. You have cancer? Just like that. So it wasn't from the fall? It will. Now, after my fall and after the diagnosis, I, on, the, on my own, had to start to inquire what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it feels like my maternal grandmother mm -hmm. may have passed on from some form of cancer herself. Right, okay. Because, but medically, they're saying that the fall, you know, caused the trauma that caused, right, you know, right, precipitated. Right. Now, going back a yes. bit, do you think from your experience, would you say that, you know, and because mothers are watching, mm -hmm. sisters, you know, so many women are watching, men are watching as well, would you say that when we have like minor accidents at home, for example, so a child falls, somebody falls, should we actually go and have an x-ray and not just assume that because you can stand up, it's fine? Like this is where I speak to people and say, look, I have now taking it upon myself to tell people to stop self-medicating. Yes. Get to the nearest medical personnel as soon as you can. We need to stop to take painkillers We need as for the slightest things. And I must owe it to my parents. The moment we noticed something was wrong, we went to the hospital the very next day. Because, um, I mean, the, the, the normal thing people do is just say, go, go and buy rub oh, yeah. or some, you know, oh, methylatum yeah. or something, and then just rub Absolutely. it on. Absolutely. But you probably should, because you said it was a clot. Yes. Okay. So it was a clot. And now, when everything had happened, was then I, well, it was when I started to realize that, oh, before the fall, I started to feel slight pains in the mm. knee. And I started to rub, mentholated, ointment in it. Mm. So it's... Many things all wrapped up in one. Mm -hmm. It's an attitude mm -hmm. of just overlooking yeah. the sliders. You know, there's, no a little, there's, a, there's a little, there's there's a little bump here. Hey, let's poke it. Let's see what's in it. That attitude needs to stop. That attitude needs to end. Because it, it can be triggering something it, even bigger. I promise you that the moment that I started to feel pain, if I had gone to the hospital, just probably maybe would have been able to save, salvage it. Now, how you were even told, oh. because, you know, that is another issue generally in, in, in Africa. Sometimes um, we sort of face, you know, the way certain things are told us certain conditions are, you know, you just have this, you just have that, you know, without any counseling, without, how did, how did, how, what was your reaction? In, you know, when I was trying to remember, we played the incidents and, you know, for the book purpose, I remember that I had to, I had shut out that part. How old were you at the time, if you don't mind 20. me asking? I was 20, I was in my second year and I was okay. 20. And I had to shut down, I had shut down that part of my life for such a long time because, I remember vividly that when I was told, I went to the hospital with my father. And, you know, the doctor, I had an out of body experience, and I kid you not, like mm. people were talking around me, and I was numb, you know, I was, it, it literally was like I was over them, watching what was happening, and they were not talking to me. So at the moment, my father looked at me and said, Hey, the, you know, no, the doctor looked at me and said, young lady, we're talking to you. And I looked him straight in the eye and said, you cannot be talking to me. Like, if he had even told me to take my pinky finger away, you know, I would have asked for three months to think about it. You're talking about a leg, a whole leg. So no, so he told you you had cancer and told you you had He just to... told me, you know, and I kid you not, young lady, you have cancer. Anywhere in the world that you go, what the doctors will tell you is an amputation. So I am booking you for, an, for a surgery That's just what he said. on Monday. I kid you not. I'm glad that I did not remember. I blanked out, so I do not remember his face. I do not remember his name. And I'd always wondered what would I have done with both his name and his face if I, I figured that it out. It probably would have haunted you, I would, know? It would have haunted me, yeah. and I've just seen him years later and said, you did this, but you know, I had to, a lot of healing to also do for mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. to allow him to just go and say, you know what, that's the best that he knew to do. And he was only telling me how best to handle it. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen in Africa and how our pe medical personnel will have to show some empathy, mm -hmm. but I suspect and I'm hoping that it's better than it was 13, 12 years ago when this right. happened. 
And if it hasn't changed, then we are in way bigger trouble than we probably thought. Now, obviously, your life has changed. Girl. I mean, you know, physically mm -hmm. and everything. But how, how do you think, um, you know, are people treating you the same? Hmm. Well, people did not treat us as a family now the same during the whole ordeal because quite a number of people went. You know, it was, it was mysticism. Nobody understood what it was. We're in Africa. So stories started to spread. Things started, I mean, someone actually even said that my mother used my leg for juju. Ju ju. And I asked, oh my, I asked my mom, I said, please, where is the money that you used this leg for? <laughs> if we, maybe if we had found the money. Honestly, because, you know, she called me, first time my mother ever called me and she was crying. I'm like, what That's happened? Oh, yes. You know, it was her neighbor, and it was... And are you a Christian family? I'm, I'm, well, I was born into a Muslim home, but my parents um, are Muslims, and I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian so okay. long. So I knew she needed her own healing and yeah, forgiveness. Yeah. And I'm glad that it didn't take her as long as I would have suspected, because... Mm -hmm. Over but time, it, didn't, it didn't tarnish your relationship with her? It, no, it didn't. It, mm. they, they had their own healing to do. You know, elders in the community had to come ask my mom forgiveness. And mom would say, you know, it's okay. You know, she said what it is she wanted to say. So it, it was hard. Um, people left. Quite a number of them came back. Um, I gained more people that I had never known. And um, the experience just opened my eyes to understanding how important it is to be there for people. What about your friends? Well, I, I've always been a friend. Um, it was the same thing. I, I feel like a number of them, and most of them actually stayed, to be very mm. honest. I'm not mm. going to paint a picture of, hey, my friends deserted me. Mm. Most of my mm. friends actually stayed. Mm. My classmates, my homemates, most of them actually did stay. And I would always be indebted to them because right. they actually did help the journey. They also made me understand that nothing extraordinary was happening by their staying and their being around. Mm -hmm. And for the ones that I you know, became friends with me because of the ordeal, it just warmed my heart that, oh, wow, you know, this is actually They've an They've seen intrigue. me as I am and they love me as exactly. I am. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. beautiful. Very, very beautiful. Wow. Wow. Oh, my goodness. There are thousand and one things going through my mind hmm. now, you know. But then how, how would you say you healed? Wow. You know, because like, you know, mm. I, I'm asking this because when you talk about healing again, a lot of yeah. people think of a sore, oh, a yeah. scar, a wound, yeah. healing, no the more healing blood. But I'm talking about heart. in here. Uh, uh, uh. I'm talking about in here because uh. if your body is healed and your spirit, your soul, your broken. inside is not healed, yeah. is broken, you are not healed. I, 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 you know, I, I'll always say I'm grateful to my parents, both of them. And um, my parents, you know, I don't think they understood what they were doing because if they did, um, maybe it would have been different. But my father is a very positive person, highly optimistic. My mm -hmm. mom is a very skeptical, what if, what if. So I grew up with the mindset of, you know, there's always good in a story. There's mm. always, always good. I'm a highly positive person. Mm. You know, I will give you another chance and another chance and mm. another chance until you, you yourself will know, ah, ah. I have messed up fully. So I saw the I saw the journey as you know something positive. I didn't think about the negatives. I wasn't scared. I was certain that I wasn't going to die. I so you had the surgery in Nigeria? I had the surgery in Nigeria. I, I was certain I wasn't going to die. I was certain that I will be okay. I wasn't bothered about the next day. And I feel like that actually did help me and the healing process in my mind. Because all that I wanted through the trajectory from the diagnosis to the amputation because it took months. It took months for us to understand, to internalize, to accept. It took a lot of time. And you know, I shared extensively about what happened in between that whole process. And when I got to the end, how I was certain that, young lady, this is the end. And if you're not careful, you'll lose your life. So because it was a journey, healing has started to take place. Mm. Healing was taking place. I'm mm. an only child of both of them. I had to be strong. So I had to be strong for my mom. My mom was almost losing her mind. She was, almost, she was still strong around me, but she would break. The slightest one, she, she just sees me cry. She would break. And you could tell that it was emotions that she had bottled up. And the moment there was an outlet, she would just start crying and crying. So I had to be strong. So my healing was faster than a lot of people would have suspected. But what then happened through the years was, 
as the years went by, because of the things that I had left unattended, I had to visit it. And then I had to, some, to unnerve, you know, open this car again. I said, okay, you know what, we need to open this and then visit every other thing. So it's not being um, an easy peasy journey, but I'm glad that it's taking me this long to understand that. Would you say all of this has made you who you are today and who you're becoming? Because absolutely. I'm sure you're still on a journey. Absolutely. I, you know, I would always say at the back of the book, I remember writing something about um, how it's just me making an, an attempt to share the trajectory of my life into the woman that I'm daily becoming yeah. and I'm evolving into. And it has shaped me and has changed my life forever. Now I see someone in need for a medical cause and I understand because we went to nothing. We, did, we, did, we spent everything that we had. And people that I did not know, like my classmates in university, were doing fundraising. And I had no idea that happened until like our fourth or fifth year. Wow. So when I found out, I'm like, you wow. guys, you did this. I wow. was shocked. So I, I, I see it and people now understand why every now and then I'll see a medical course on social media and I'll say, you guys, even if it's as little as five CDs, let's do let's something. Let's put something together. Let's help this person. I'm, I'm a product of grace and goodwill. So now I understand it without a doubt and it has shaped and changed my life for. Ever. Uh, let's talk a bit about um, disability um, access yes. in Nigeria, in Ghana, Africa. You've been in Ghana well, just one day. How has it even been? Because sometimes you go to certain places yeah. and if you're in a wheelchair... Yes, you... like, yeah, yeah, it's inaccessible. I feel like um, Africa forgets that the world has left her. And the world is not waiting for her to play catch up any longer. She needs to wake up and address every issue at the same time. Mm. Gone are the days where we would take politics and governance and security and say these are the three most important things. Mm. Now, as it is across the globe, every single thing needs priority mm. and disability mm. and inclusion happens to be one of it. If the United Nations is saying that one of the things that you know is paramount to the SDG by 2030 is inclusion. Africa needs to stand up and start to act. Africa does not even know how many people are living with disability mm. in her continent, so she cannot even plan adequately for them. She doesn't know what, you know, what type of disability what is exists. Going to, what is going to spark this change? If, until persons like myself stand up and start to speak and start to demand more. So what are, you, what are you doing in Nigeria? Now, I have started a non-profit called Amputees United. Prior to that, I've been working with the Irede Foundation. And what the Irede Foundation does basically is um, advocacy and also provision of prosthetic parts to children once we pick the kids up till they are 18. And with children, it means that thrice a year, twice a year, because they change, they grow. And the foundations, um, and you it's know, quite expensive, version. Yes, right? it's not to just tick the numbers. We give standard prosthetic limbs. We give standard You, you have limbs. one, right? I've had like two, but I just got tired. So, yeah. We give standard prosthetic limbs. Amputees United is now catering for the older people to say, look, what we're here to do is we're creating a safe haven for you, mm. a place where we can all come. Yeah, let us talk. What is biting you? How are you feeling? You're having phantom pains. How what are some of what, what I like that? How, how are you feeling? What are some of the answers you get sometimes? Disillusionment, confusion, lack of acceptance, fear, you know, and they are all valid. They are disillusioned because they do not know whether we can cater for them. Mm. They are scared because they are not sure we'll give them the opportunities. They are also um, not hopeful because they are, they are not sure we would accept them. Talking about acceptance, I'm thinking about relationships. Oh, yes. Now, how did that affect, I don't know if you were in a relationship at the yeah. time, but you said you did say you were in a relationship <laughs> now. You whispered, I heard something, uh-huh. You know. Now, how would you say that has affected or impacted mm. your current relationship? I, I feel like my current relationship... Um, he had always seen me. He had always known that I'm a person living with disability. So it would have been very silly. So he met you after? Yes. It would have been very silly of him to now wake up one day and say, hey, because you have one leg, I'm not interested. It, it will hurt me, clearly. But I'm like, you know, I'll, I ha I'll have a better understanding. Say, you know what? You're not deserving of me. Mm. Just go. 
mm. but he he met me after we were friends for such a long time. So he saw me. He understood the things that I could. I can be very stubborn and very strong-willed, and you know I can do it. Yeah, lawyer, right? <laughs> <laughs> but during the whole ordeal, to be very frank. Yes, I, I, was, I was in a relationship and then we broke up. We were not sure we were going to come back together. But I suspect that if I had not had to take time off my life, the possibility of, you know, mending it and seeing if things could work out would have been very high. Mm. Just the possibility. So I really do not know if that would have happened. And I just allowed, you know, it was hurtful. Mm. It was really, really hurtful because mm. I said, so this is because they cut my leg. Is that why we're not looking at... You know, not forgetting that I was the one that said, you know what, I think we should end this relationship because things are not working out. So it's, it's just a possibility and I don't know how it feels. I, I believe very strongly that if you're around people who live with disability and you open your heart, you forget the disabilities. Um, <laughs> It's almost like, you know, falling in love with you, you there's just not your path. Exactly. I, I, you I have evolved person. into understanding that I am more than my body. I am way, way, way more than my body. I am more than having, you know, one, one limb. I am more than all of it. So if I'm not seen as a holistic person, everything that I bring, whether it's a relationship, a romantic relationship, a business relationship, a career relationship, then it's actually not worth it getting into a partnership with individuals of that nature. Mm -hmm. So people get scared. Women are scared. Will a man date me? Will a man ask me out again? A guy goes... Do you talk to women about oh, yes, things I like do. this? Yeah. I do. And um, I'm very glad that, you know, it's they now see that I'm in a relationship and I've not always been in a relationship. Mm. So they understand that, hey, okay, it, it can actually work. Mm. It's one day at a time. I would always tell them, nobody's going to marry a liability. Whether you're fully bodied or you, you have a limb loss, find yourself. You need to be fine by yourself. You need to affirm yourself. I didn't need a man Please to tell say it me. again. Find yourself. You need to know who you are. You need to be sure about it. Affirm yourself. I didn't need a man to tell me I was beautiful. My first affirmation person or tool and, you know, was my father. And because I understood what he meant, my father made relating with God the Father easier for me. So I understood what the fatherly love is. Unfortunately and sadly, not everyone is as fortunate as I was. Yeah. So we can actually unlearn the things and the experiences that we were born into. So your father did not affirm you. So your brother did not affirm you. It's affirm okay. After who is it that you are? Who do you tell yourself that you are? If you don't do all of that, there's so much I can inspire, but there's a part where you have to self-motivate yourself. Stand up and do the ginger. Say, I mean, hey, if, hey, you, hey. if you follow me, if you follow me on Instagram, <laughs> I keep saying it all the time. Yes. Promote yourself, love yourself, affirm yourself, confirm yourself. Yes. I mean, you have, I, 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 so, the, so I have an auntie, okay? And um, anytime she's dressed and you say, auntie, you're looking nice, she'll say, Okay, she'll say it in tree. Okay. I will tell I'll say it in tree and then I'll try to say, Wusa. Wusa means don't you see? So don't you see means I know. I know. I, by I myself. know already. Yes. Now, I mean it will sound arrogant or no. cocky or no. you know, but it's almost like she is accepted herself. Absolutely. And you have to and in doing that, everybody else will accept you. It's because when they simple. see your the confidence is what is attractive. It is look, it's so attractive. Like you I <laughs> I've had more advances as a person with one leg than I did with both legs. Mm. So you're the one who now decides, okay, this person... Cuts, Are you sure your cuts. work hasn't changed? <sighs> no, not exactly. <laughs> now, this tagline here... Yes. So the book is called Adenike. Yes. And then her story, um, your movie, movie, his glory. Mm. What is it about? What's so that? it's my story. Social media makes people feel like they know you. Mm. So this is me owning the narrative, saying this is my own story. I am sharing my story from my own perspective, from mm -hmm. what happened. Your movie, because it is them getting a glimpse into what my reality is. Mm. And without a doubt, it's to God's glory. That's the only reason why I'm writing all of this. And this is Adenike, the book, the probably be Adenike, the movie, Adenike, the this, Adenike, the that. But that's just a summation, and it summarizes the entirety of who it is that I am. I've owned my story. Because I've owned my story, I'm able to own this whole journey. I say, look, I really don't keep, days I don't have the energy. I'm like, you guys, remember I have one leg. I'm not in the mood to do all these things. I own it squarely, fairly, and I'm unashamedly excited about the journey. Wow, you are a solid rock. 
That's what I've even just did. I just dropped my solid rock. Wow. Like I just love it because you're being a rock for others. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And that's, that's, that took a long while for me to accept. I, I had to understand that my journey wasn't just me. And I realized that with God, you see that selflessness is a part of the journey where you just drop everything that you're doing and God is saying, this is it, this people. is the person, this is the person, mm. keep going up. So through people. all of this, what would you say has been the most challenging? Wow. I think the most challenging is the reality that I have one leg and it's a, cha it's a challenge that hits every now and then. Not because, I, of course I miss my right leg. Oh, please, I miss my right leg. Some days I just wake up like, you guys, I miss my right leg. But it's challenging for several reasons. Even if I did have a prosthetic limb, you'd be tired. It's sometimes it gives you back pain. Oh, it does rather? Yeah, yeah. it okay. gives, you know, gives back pain. The cost of maintaining is, you know, above knee, I'm really high above knee amputation. Getting it to fit, thankfully, has not become, um, has become easier. But being a distant patient, my, my process is in Houston, Texas. You know, the cost of having to travel. It's, it's an expensive mm, it's life. Expensive. It's an expensive life. It's a privileged life that I do not take for granted. And that actually humbles me in the moments where I feel, oh, I just, okay, you know what? Just keep yeah. quiet. So it feels like it's not a challenge to others, but it's my own personal challenge. You know, living in a space like Nigeria where you need to, uh, you need to fight for preferential parking and all of it, but... So do you, the, the, you don't have like disability access cards or Girl, anything? For... We are getting there. We are getting there. Don't worry. I, I'm going to sit, take a picture very soon. I say, hey, we have the cards now. I Coming told you. <laughs> Coming to Wow. Well done. Thank you. You are serious inspiration. Wow. Like, wow. Totally amazed. And I'm so, so inspired. So do you see yourself past your disability? Oh, sure. Yeah. Definitely. And then what do you think about victimization? Look, the picture behind this book was a picture of liberation. And, you know, this picture would continue to mean a lot to me till I die. Uh, it took a lot for me to not just wear a swimsuit this way, um, but to show my stomach, my residual limb. Mm. And I took the picture and it liberated me, like, you know what? What I have been hiding, you guys, this is it. And that actually- Were you hiding it before? I was unconsciously. You were? I was unconsciously. You know, I would always wear long dresses, I would always wear skirts, you would never see me. So at first I wore shorts to work, I'd be like, hey, what's going on? You know, and from wearing shorts to work, then I stopped wearing the leg to work. I'm like, oh, oh, so what's going on here? You know, I was still, it didn't affect my productivity at work, mm -hmm. but I was able to unravel the different parts and sides that exist on the inside of me. And then, I'd like you to do one thing. I'd like you to speak to the ladies out there, okay? <laughs> now, maybe there's somebody out there battling something. It doesn't Ooh. have to be physical. Like we've already said, it could be emotional, it could be mental, it could be, you know, you know, they're just going through something that is making them hide. Mm. I just want you to give them one word, wow. a word of encouragement from your personal experience. Okay, so I, I would always say that this is an experience that is very personal to me. And this experience did not just happen in a day. It took me nine years, nine years to get here, to share with myself and the people around me that I could take a picture of this nature and share it. So if you're out there, whatever the battle is, I'm not saying get up today. I'm only saying start the journey now. If you start the journey now, it makes the end way easier and sooner. So, you know, as women, we complain about many things. I have stretch marks, I have fat arms, I have fat legs, my this is that. You have legs and you have arms. Do you know how many people do not even have the arms and the legs? Start to think about it that way. Maybe you would appreciate it that you, in fact you have legs and arms. If you can do some work on it, do some work on it. If you've done work and nothing seems to be working, it's okay, own your body. Love yourself, honestly, and just liberate your mind. You own yourself. You do not owe anybody in the world any explanations but yourself. Own your journey. I, this picture means a million and one things to me, and I'm sharing it with you as a tool of liberty. But remember, 
It didn't happen in a day. It took me nine years. And that was what made me even color my hair when I had the gold hair because I wanted something. It was a spunk in my face. It was a spunk in this you know, trajectory of my life. I just wanted to you know, enter a room and be the light. And literally, that's what has happened since this experience. I go into places and I dispel darkness. I bring joy. I bring hope. And if I can do it, I bet you can do even way more than this. So I love you. Embrace your journey, own your story, and go for the stars. I wish I could hug you, but <laughs> I, I'll take a sip. Yay, no, cheers. cheers. That was awesome. Awesome. This is so nice. And I have a surprise for you. A little teeny weeny surprise. Little teeny weeny surprise. See me dancing. I love okay. it. Yay. Okay, now this is just to say thank you so much. First of all, for visiting our beautiful country, Ghana. I know you're in love. Girl. Yes. Yeah, I'm coming and back come soon. again. I know. <laughs> you know, and you're always welcome. We, we're very hospitable in Ghana. Yes. We love you. You can always call me. Yes. Um, this is a little gift, okay? I'm giving oh. each of my guests, okay? This is the Rene Q Love Pillow. You've said a lot already about self-love, yes. about having a solid foundation and everything. This is the main purpose of introducing this. Okay, to women out there, to introduce self-love, accepting yourself, self-acceptance, self-appreciation. Yes. So this is a little gift, so you remember me all the time. Yes, I okay. am. I am. Um, and I also want you to share with us one thing you love about you. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, I'm very grateful for this gift. And um, one thing I love about me is I'm always, always willing to unlearn bad things. It, it, you know, it took a while for me to get there, but unlearning has been one of the biggest tools that has helped me evolve. So um, I'm unlearning that self-love means being wicked and um, you know, unempathetic to others. I'm learning that self-love also means loving the people around me. So yeah, that's one thing that means um, that, you know, that's how nice is it for me. So I love my pillow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been awesome having you on the Today's Thank Women you. Show. And ladies, I mean, this is life. I love today's episode so much because it is so real. Life is unexpected. Anything can happen at any, any time. But the main trick or the main secret to success is overcoming. Not allowing anything to let you sink. You, we really need to float because we are going to fly. So ladies out there, you are today's woman. There's no giving up. Don't let any situation let you sink. You need to rise above it. Thank you. I love you so much. I love Thank you. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> on today. It's been awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. God bless Amen. you. Thank Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>